Zone 5. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Jay Parker. I'm from Washington State. And this question regards uh, mistakes. So that being the case, it should probably be directed to Mr. Munger. Mr. Munger, I know you're fond of uh, evoking humility to promote rational thought. So my question is, what's the most recent business mistake that you've made, Mr. Munger, and why did it occur? I'm going to take notes on this one. <laughs> the mistakes that have been most extreme in Berkshire's history are mistakes of omission. Uh, they don't show up in our figures. Uh, they show up in opportunity costs. In other words, we, we have opportunities we almost do it. In retrospect, we can tell that we were very much mistaken not to do it. In terms of the shareholders, those are the ones in our history that have really cost the most. And very few managements do much thinking or talking about opportunity costs. But Warren, we have blown Billions and billions and billions. I might as well say it. <laughs> right, right. And we keep doing it. Some might say we're getting better at it. <laughs> I don't like mentioning the specific companies because the, you know, we, we, we may in due course want to buy do so at our price. But... Uh, practically everywhere in, in life and in corporate life, too, uh, what really costs in comparison with what easily might have been are the blown opportunities. I mean, it just, it's an awesome amount of money. When I was somewhat younger, I was offered 300 shares of Bell Ridge Oil. An idiot could have told there was no possibility of losing money in a large possibility of making money. I bought it. The guy called me back three days later and offered me 1,500 more shares. But this time I had to sell something to buy the damn Bellridge oil. That mistake, if you traced it through, has cost me $200 million. And I, it was all because I, I had to go to a slight inconvenience and sell something. Berkshire does that kind of thing, too. We never get over it. Yeah, I might add that when we speak of errors of, uh, of omission, of which we've had plenty, and some very big ones, uh, we don't mean not buying some stock where we, a friend runs it or we know the name and it went from one to a hundred. That doesn't mean anything. It's only, we only regard errors as being things that are within our circle of competence. So. If somebody knows how to make money in cocoa beans or they know how to make money in a software company or anything, and, and we miss that, that is not an error as far as we're concerned. What's an error is when it's something we understand and we stand there and stare at it and we don't do anything. Or worse yet, what really gets me is when we do something very small with it. We do an, an eyedropper's worth of it, uh, when we could do it very big. Uh, Charlie... Uh, refers to that elegantly when I do that sort of thing is when I'm sucking my thumb. Uh, and, and they're really, I mean, we have, we have, we have been thumb suckers uh, at times uh, with businesses that we understood well. And uh, it may have been because we started buying and the price moved up a little and, and uh, we waited around hoping we would get more at the price we originally started. There can be a lot of things. Uh, uh, but th those are... Those are huge mistakes. Conventional accounting, of course, does not pick those up at all, but, but uh, they're in our scorebook. Zone 7. Good morning. Uh, I'm Murray Cass from Markham, Ontario. Uh, the financial community relies heavily on the P-E ratio when evaluating prospective investments. When you buy a company, you must certainly consider not just the future stream of earnings, but also the company's financial condition, among other things. By financial condition, I'm speaking mainly of cash and debt. But the PE doesn't take into consideration either cash or debt. 
Occasionally, you see a company with consistently positive free cash flow trading just over cash value, effectively giving away the future earnings. In cases like this, the PE looks terribly overstated unless adjusted for cash and debt. I've always preferred companies with oodles of cash to those burdened with lots of debt. And then I read Phil Fisher's book, Conservative Investors Sleep Well. Well, I haven't slept well since. Uh, he really confused me when he commented that hoarding cash was evil. He wrote that instead, companies should either put the cash to good use or distribute it to shareholders. Can I get your thoughts on this? Well, there are times when we're awash in cash, and there have been plenty of times when we didn't have enough cash. Uh, uh, Charlie and I, I remember in the late 60s, we were, when bank credit was very difficult, we were, we were uh, looking for money over in the... Uh, in the Middle East, you remember that, Charlie? Yes, Bank? I do. Yeah, and uh, they wanted us to repay it in dinars. Yeah, and the and the guy that wanted us to repay it, repay him in, in diners or diners or whatever the hell they call them, uh, was also the guy that determined the value of those things. So at the we we <laughs> we were not terribly excited about about him on payday and having him decide the exchange rate on that date. But but we we obviously are looking every day for ways to deploy cash. And we would never have cash around just to have cash. I mean, we would never think that we should have a cash position uh, of X percent. And I, frankly, I think these asset allocation things that that uh, tacticians in Wall Street put out, you know, about 60% stocks and 30%, we, we think that's total nonsense. Uh, so we want to have all our money working in decent businesses, but sometimes we can't find them or sometimes cash comes in expectedly or sometimes we sell something uh, and, and we have more cash around than we would like. And more cash around mean, than we would like means that we have 10 or 15 cents around because uh, we, we want money employed, but we'll never employ it, just employ it. And, 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 and uh, uh, in recent years, we've tended to be cash heavy, but not because we wanted cash per se. In the mid-70s, uh, you know, we were scraping around for every dime we could find to buy things. We don't like, we don't like lots of leverage, and we never will. We'll, ne we'll never, we'll never, we'll never uh, borrow lots of money at Berkshire. It's just not our style. But uh, you will, you will uh, find us quite unhappy over time if, if cash just keeps building up. And I, I think one way or another we'll find ways to use it. Charlie? I can't add anything to that. Zone six, please. My name is Joseph Lepre. I am from Minneapolis, Minnesota. In recent years, tobacco companies have been compelled to pay large damages for marketing their unhealthy but discretionary products. My question has two parts. First, does the potential for similar damage liabilities reduce the intrinsic value of Coca-Cola, Seas Candies, Dairy Queen, or any other business which sells discretionary products of questionable healthfulness. Not that I don't like these products. And second, are either of you concerned that a possible erosion in the principle of caveat emptor is uh, undermining the legal basis of contracts in general. Thank you for taking my question. Well, the, the products you described I've been living on for 70 years, so they'll probably haul me in on a, as a witness if I, uh, that uh, they don't do much damage. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I think if, you know, if you're, if you're opposed to sugar, and the, I think the average human being eats something like 550 pounds dry weight of, of, uh, of food a year, and I think 125 pounds or thereabouts. I feel like it consists of sugar in one form or another. I mean, it's it's in practically every product that you have, and it's a, it happens to be in Coca-Cola, it happens to be in Seas Candy, but it's in practically everything. You're, I mean, it, it's over 20 percent of what Americans are consuming one way or another, and you know the the average lifespan of Americans keeps going up. So it, uh, I, I I I would I would not be worried at all about product liability in 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 connection uh, with those companies, but product liability generally is an area that is a fertile field for the uh, the plaintiffs bar, and it's we are conscious 
in buying into businesses, and we have passed up some businesses because we were worried about, about the product liability potential. Uh, unless there is some legislative solution, I think you will see more and more uh, uh, of the GDP going uh, uh, into liability awards and uh, uh, whether there will be any whether there will be any change by legislation I don't know but it, it's it's you know it's a big field and the lottery ticket aspect of it is so attractive because if an attorney can gamble a modest amount of time or even a reasonable amount of time and have a potential payoff of 10 or 20 or maybe in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars you know that that that's a decent lottery ticket who knows what 12 people uh, you know are going to be on the jury as, as one of my friends who's a lawyer said you know he said Lincoln said you can fool all of the people some of the time and all of the uh, uh, some of the people all the time and all of the people some of the time but not all of them all the time he says I'm just looking for 12 that you can fool all of the time you know and, and uh, you, all, all you have to do is get uh, get an award and the odds are, are fairly favorable in, an, in a nation where lots of zeros have sort of lost meaning to people. So it's a very real concern in any business we get into in terms of trying to evaluate uh, product liability. Charlie? You know, what's particularly pernicious is the uh, increasing political power of the plaintiff's contingency fee bar. If you're on a state Supreme Court, uh, for, in most places, you're on for life. If you at least uh, you're on for life, if you want to stay for life. And the one thing that could get you off the court would be to really irritate some important group. And I think that greatly helps a lot of abusive conduct in the courts. I think the judges of the country haven't been nearly as tough as they should be on junk science, junk economic testimony, uh, trashy lawyers, uh, and I don't see... And I don't, don't see uh, many signs that it's getting better. In Texas, they actually uh, improved the Supreme Court of Texas, which really needed it. So there are occasional glim glimmers of light. We, we make our decisions in insurance and in buying businesses with a very pessimistic attitude uh, toward the chances of, 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 uh, of uh, that particular ill that Charlie described being even moderated. I mean, we, we, we think... If, we would project out that the trend would accelerate, but that's just our natural way of, of building in a margin of safety uh, in, in decisions. Don't worry about eating the seized candy or the Dairy Queen or the, the Coke. I, uh, uh, you know, if, if you read the papers long enough, they, I use a lot of salt, and, and uh, uh, you know, I was, I was always being warned about that. And then, you know, a few years ago, they started saying, you know, you, you can't get enough salt and all that. I don't know what the answer is, but I feel terrific. <laughs>